sunumlarımıza başlamadan önce sizleri bu sene yepyeni bir formatla karşınıza çıkan Arkimit hakkında ufak bir bilgi vermek istiyoruz. Konuşmacılarımızın sunumları ara verilmeden ard arda devam edecektir. Eş zamanlı olarak kahve ikramlarımız fuayede tüm gün devam edecek. Bu kısa bilgilendirmenin ardından siz konuklarımıza ilk konuşmacımızı tak, e, takdim etmek istiyoruz. Profesör Carlo Ratti, MIT'de eğitim vermekte ve Sensible City Lab'in yürütücüsü. Carlo Ratti, işleri dünya çapında sergilenmiştir. Bunlar arasında Venedik Biennale'i, Barcelona Tasarım Müzesi, Londra Bilim Müzesi, San Francisco'da Gafta ve New York'ta MoMA gibi yerler vardır. Daha nice ödül ve başarının yanı sıra 2011 yılında Renzo Piano Vakfı tarafından verilen Mimarlıkta Yeni Yetenekler ödülünü alan Carlo Ratti, bugün bizlere hisseden ve tepki veren Mimari adlı sunumu ile bizlere eşlik ediyor. Carlo Ratti'yi konuşmasını yapmak üzere sahneye davet ediyoruz. Thank you. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Sorry, I'll, uh, I'll switch to, to English. Um, great pleasure to be here, to be back in Istanbul. We got the slides. Can you just try if the sound uh, is working? So I, I wanted to start with this. This is actually one of the automats that were very popular in France in the late 18th century. This is actually one of the ones by Marie Antoinette. And I wanted to start with this because I think that it actually highlights something that has been very present in architecture, in art, for forever. Uh, you know, it's the old idea that Michelangelo uh, expressed. The story goes in Italy that uh, when he sculpted the mose, he took a hammer, he threw the hammer at the mose, there's supposedly still a little chip on the knee. And then he shouted, Perché non parli? Why don't you speak? And this is really about how can we create things that actually speak back to us, that talk back to us. And if you look at the past of architecture, you know, when, you, when Guarini designed and, and, and built his beautiful Baroque cupola, he was trying to do something that was almost alive, that looked dynamic, full of movement and, uh, and, uh, and energy, and, and yes, and life. And the same is what we saw over over and over again, think about uh, the early 20th century with Art Nouveau and Dart Deco and Liberty, or think about this, which is Zaha did at Newbridge in, uh, in Saragossa. You know, but if you look at this well, actually if you look at this in more detail, there's a kind of tragedy in there. You know, that looks alive, that wants to capture movement and flows, but it's actually frozen in death. That's made of steel and stone and concrete. Uh, you know, it doesn't move. And if you, if you look at this, then there's a kind of another approach trying to address the same, the same goal of trying to build a living system that uh, we've seen across the, the past of architecture. What you see here is actually uh, the Fun Palace by Cedric Price. Uh, Cedric Price in the late 20th century, like many of the people um, who were working with him, was inspired by cybernetics. Cybernetics is really the, the art and science that uh, uh, begets inanimate objects in, that behave like living systems. So how can we actually create a dynamic relationship with, uh, with the things around ourselves? And what we believe today is that actually, thanks to what happened to our cities, our cities have been covered, layered, with many different types of networks, sensors, digital and digital layers, one on the top of the other. Well, because of all of this, we think that for the first time, actually, our cities are starting to talk back to us, if you want. Talk, talk to me was the title of an exhibition at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in, uh, in New York a few years ago. Um, we are part of it. Uh, the idea that today, because of this, our objects, our homes, our cities are starting to talk back to us. And the way this is working is really by putting together both the sensing, the ability to understand better our cities or the things around ourselves, and then actuating, how we can respond to that. Almost as if every atom out there were becoming both a sensor and an actuator in the physical world. Now, I'll give you just some example of how we can sense our city today in a different way. When you look at this, this is actually the city of Lisbon. We could not have described Lisbon like this a few years ago. That's Lisbon captured using billions, billions and billions of data points collected actually through the taxi network in the city. 
Um, when you got this information, information that's collected through GPS or through cell phone, uh, then the city, in a certain sense, you can describe it as a living system. In the next project, I'll show you, it's an old project, it's one of the first ones we did. Um, but in this project, what we did was, uh, back in 2006, uh, collect data from millions and millions of people, anonymized and aggregated in a big city. The city in, in question was Rome. And actually then, um, analyze the data uh, to see how people were moving using data from, as I said, from cell phone networks. Uh, now, we were very lucky in 2006 because that year is the year that uh, we had the Soccer World Cup. As you might recall, Italy and France were playing. Um, that was in Germany, and in the end, Italy won. Look at what happened in the city of Rome by using the data from, from the cell phone network. So here you see the, the day of the final. You see that's the morning. People moving here and there, you see the Colosseum and the river. It's the early afternoon now. Then the match begins, silence. Nobody talks anymore. France scores, Italy scores half time. People make a quick call. Second half, and then first overtime, second. The famous headbutt by Zidane, and finally, Italy wins. And then, uh, you know, that night, everybody went. Everybody went to celebrate up here. You see a big peak in the center of the city. Um, the following day, again, people went to the center to meet the winning team and the prime minister. Then by the end of the day, actually, everybody went down here to a place called uh, Circo Massimo, where since Roman times, people go and celebrate. And so you see all the city actually moving down there by the end of the day. So um, we really can capture flows in a different way. These are global flows. These are flows uh, from New York to all over the planet. These are telecommunication data from AT&T that tells you how New York connects with all the other cities across the world. And what you see here, you see both uh, you know, the overall information, but you can see it in a dynamic way. This was, again, also in, a, in another project at, uh, at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art. Um, we, we couldn't really look. As you see here, you know, this, the day and the night, how flow change, and uh, how New York connects with, uh, with all the rest of the world. So all of these are some examples of how we can capture information from our cities in a dynamic way using existing system, using the GPS on taxis, using the cell phone, using, in this case, all of the fiber that has been layered over our cities. Today, we can also use a lot of sensors. So what we did in this project was actually use sensors in order to address a, an important question for us. If you look at this computer on the table, you know everything about it. Today, you know every chip in this computer, how it moved on the planet, how it came together, how it became this machine. In other terms, today, we know very well the global supply chain. But we know very little about what happens after that. After we built our object, we use them, and we throw them away, then we know much less. Sometimes this is what happened to electronics when we few years from now, this computer, you know, we'd stop using, we throw it away, and then uh, it might end up where it shouldn't. A lot of electronics from Europe actually shipped illegally to Africa, from the United States to Asia. So our idea was, what if we could develop a little tag, put the tag on trash, and then follow trash as it moves on the planet? Now, we couldn't find anything off the shelf, so we had to design the little tag. It's almost like a miniature cell phone that simply reports the location of track and can last for many, many months. Uh, we did the first deployment. This was the first one in the city of Seattle. Put a little tag on all the pieces of trash. 500 volunteers came with 3,000 pieces of trash. And after putting a little tag on all of them, we started following them. So you can see the day of deployment. After a couple of days, you go to some of the main landfills next to Seattle. But it's actually a big surprise how far things started to travel. Sometimes in crazy, unpredictable ways. You get the trace that went all the way to Chicago and then down to Baja, California. Thousands and thousands of miles across the United States. And then still moving after one month or two months. thought the Farwell Symphony was the right music.
So what can you do with this? Uh, you know, if you're an engineer, if you're an architect, you can take all of this data and you can try to optimize it. So you can use it in order to create a more efficient system. Uh, look at, if you look at all those traces, you know, sometimes we put more energy into waste than what we will ever get back out of them. Or sometimes, you know, we could optimize and streamline a lot of those traces. As you saw, they were moving sometimes in, in unpredictable random ways. The second thing that's very important is that all of this data, if you share it with people, you can actually promote interest in behavioral change. Um, it's about the fact that today we know much more about the consequences of what we do. And so we can use this information in order to enact new dynamics. So just one example, at the end of the project, we were sharing information with the people who participated. And uh, somebody came to us and said, look, I used to drink water in plastic bottles every day and then throw them away and, and forget about them. And, uh, but uh, now through the project, I know that those bottles go a few miles from, from home. They go to a landfill where they will, and they will stay there forever. And so because of this, I stopped drinking water in, in plastic bottles. Um, the third thing we discovered, it, was it actually happened more recently, and that was also unpredictable. Um, that happened when a burglar came to our lab at MIT, and uh, the poor guy stole a lot of things, including many tags and computers that tell you where they go. This is what happened. All right, so here you saw how we can use sensors in, in the city, for instance, you know, for in this case, for looking at trash. But really, if you can put sensors on trash, you can really put them anywhere. You know, it's the idea of uh, ubiquitous computing, the idea of smart dust. Everything can become like a sensor and an actuator. In the next project, for instance, what we did, we used a sensor in order to better understand air quality, especially in China, which is a big issue. And we looked at the difference between Hong Kong and Shenzhen, two cities where it's very close, but actually where air quality changes radically. And look at what happens by what you see here is actually the frame of the video changes color based on the level of pollution. This was at the Hong Kong and Shenzhen Biennale just a few months ago. And um, 
I want to say, you know, these are just some examples of how we can use data to understand better our cities. The same apply to many other things in our built environment around ourselves. I just want to say something, big data, which is always is generated by sensor, can also cause big trouble. Uh, we always need to be very concerned about the data we collect. Here is just you know, a reference by Calvino. It's not from Calvino's Invisible Cities. It's from a very little known story called The Memory of the War. that actually explores what happens when we try to record and save everything that happens on the planet. And I just wanted to share it with you because uh, it's important that we all take a critical approach about what uh, all of this also means. Um, but what I want to share with you then now is the fact that sensing is very important. It's about collecting information, but then what happens next is actually transforming it. You know, that's actuating, and that's the ultimate goal then of what we all do as architects, as planners, as engineers. And I wanted to start with the first project I did when I went to MIT that really were starting to look at this actuation dimension. Um, this is a project called Sunscape. I did it in a group at the Media Lab called uh, uh, Tangible Media Group. And what we did here was actually create a sun surface that as you modified, would be sensed, as I said, you know, col information in real time would be sensed by a laser scanner, and then the actuation would be made through projecting on the top of it. But at the time already, we wanted to try to see how this could also become a living surface, a surface that moves on its own, a surface full of life, as we saw at the beginning. Now, at the time, that was 10 years ago, we, we couldn't make it, but uh, just last year, Hiroshi, the head of the group, of Tanjiro Media Group, actually managed to do it, um, which is what you see here. So you see, he's he not even there, but actually information is sensed and then transformed and then surface and material and matter is actuated. And really what we try to do over the past few years, both at, the, at our lab and in our design office, has been to work a lot on this, try to see how we can actually transform things around ourselves into things that are respond better to us in a dynamic, living way. Um, this is a project we had at the Venice Biennale. It was uh, just a small apartment, <coughs> but in this small apartment we use a projector from one single point, this projector has a movable mirror so that basically every surface around it can become a living surface. And so the design of the place was done, uh, yes, because we wanted it to be beautiful, of course, <coughs> but also because we wanted to make sure that every surface could become alive through projections and from one single point. So the architecture, the design, the geometry was done in a way that we could maximize the co-visibility of surfaces so at one point we could actually project all around itself. And you can live in it without any projection as a you know, beautiful minimalist place, but at the same time when you turn on the thing, then every surface can become alive and follow you as you move through the space. You can do this in many other cases. Another important thing is about energy consumption. If you look at this, um, it's a <coughs> this is the result of a paper we did on the MIT campus. We looked at where people are and uh, where energy goes. And if you look at the graph, you see there is no correlation whatsoever. We heat our buildings when they're empty. We may in many cases, there are, you know, the lights are on when they're empty. We cool them when they're empty. If you think about homes in the winter in the United States, you know, the homes are heated up during the whole day, and maybe we're all at work, and vice versa for our offices. Uh, so our idea was, you know, how can we actually be more <coughs> dynamic in the way we, we do this? Uh, and we did this project, was at the, it's uh, still in Venice now, until the end of the week at the, at the Biennale. We called it local warming. The idea is, could you imagine a system where actually a bubble of heat follows you around the building as you're moving through it? We did a first test that was outside MIT. Um, MIT is quite cold during the winter, so when you enter it, we allow people to step onto the carpet, and then a bubble of heat would follow them. And you could actually personalize the heat bubble. You can say, you know, I want to be at 17 degrees or 20 degrees or 25, whatever you, you want. This is the next video is the installation of the Biennale. Now, we did this in a quite, in a very expressive way, given that this is uh, the Biennale. So the 
it has to be visible, but you can think about the same thing done with uh, small LEDs uh, so that it becomes almost invisible in the counter ceiling of, of our buildings. That was the making of the Biennale this summer. So you see, uh, when, you, when you enter, then you know, this kind of bubble of heat will, uh, will follow you. And a final example I want to give you about you know, how we can, actually, we can do this in, uh, in our buildings. We can actually make our buildings more responsive to people. Is a project we did for the city of Zaragoza. Um, the mayor of Zaragoza had just won the World Expo just before Shanghai, 2008, and the theme of the expo was water. So the mayor came to us with a very precise question. As you know, here in Istanbul, as you know, you know all over this part of the world, and all over the world, actually, water has been a beautiful ingredient of architecture, planning of our cities. So Key's question was, how could we use water today in a different way in our public space? And the idea that came up um, was, imagine you have a pipe, and then on that pipe you've got many tabs, opening and closing, controlled by a computer. So if you do that, then you can create like pixels made of water. Those pixels, you know, can allow you to have a living water wall where you can show text or images or patterns. You know, even if it becomes alive so that you approach it, it opens up to, to let you through. Um, the mayor liked the idea, so we got the commission to design the building at the entrance of the expo. The building is called Digital Water Pavilion. As you see, you can show images or text or patterns on the outside, no doors or windows, but when you approach it, it opens up to let you in. When you're inside, actually, all of the walls expand and shrink based on how many people you have. <coughs> the roof is also covered with a thin layer of water. Incidentally, what you see next to it is the Zaha Hadid Bridge I showed at the beginning, next to our site at the entrance of the expo. Then if you've got too much wind, you can lower the, the roof to minimize splashing. Or at the end of the day, you can actually close the building and the whole architecture disappears. Um, this was the video we did. Um, initially, honestly, we didn't think, we were not sure if it would be built. Uh, in the end, it was built very quickly at the end, a uh, few months before the expo. Um, here you can see, uh, before the opening, we were doing some tests. I like this picture because that guy stopped there. You see, he had a trolley, was going to the station, which is nearby, and said, what the hell is going on here? Um, here it was actually projecting images on the water, so it's the digital pixels made of light on the top of these physical pixels made of water. Uh, here it was myself trying not to get wet, so actually testing the opening and closing of the building in the sensors that control it. Now I should tell you now what happened one night when all of the sensors stopped working. You know, the building has thousands of valves and hundreds of sensors all controlled by a computer, and somehow that night, all the sensors that detect people when they approach the building stop working. No, that night we were terrified because we didn't, wouldn't, we didn't know what, what would happen. The building would keep on doing its own crazy things and cats and holes and other things, but without responding to people anymore. Um, but actually that night was one of the most fun nights ever. That night, thousands of kids from all over the city went to the building to play a new game. Not anymore a building that opens up when you approach it, but actually a building that you need to engage like this. <laughs> And for us it was important because as architects, as engineers, we always think that we know how people will use, <coughs> will use the things we design, but then reality, and especially human reality, is always a surprise. In the last remaining few minutes, uh, what I wanted to share with you is one project in more detail. And this is a project we did with Copenhagen. The city came to us to look at how we could use uh, digital in order to enact new things, new dynamics related to traffic in the city. And in particular, we decided to focus on bikes, because traffic in Copenhagen means bikes. 
as you see in this picture. So we came up with this idea. Welcome to the Copenhagen wheel. The wheel that turns your ordinary bike into a smart electric hybrid. Quickly and easily with no additional batteries or wires. The Copenhagen wheel allows you to capture the energy dissipated while braking and cycling. And save it for when you need a bit of a boost. Controlled through your smartphone, the Copenhagen wheel becomes a natural extension of your everyday life. The Copenhagen wheel is your personal trainer, sensing your effort level and providing you with real-time feedback about your fitness and exercise goals. The Copenhagen wheel also enhances your experience of the city. It connects you with things a cyclist wants to know. Upcoming traffic congestion, road conditions and pollution levels. Choose to keep your data or share it with your friends and other cyclists through social networks like Facebook. As you ride, you also collect green miles. It's similar to a frequent flyer program, but good for the environment. Elegant, responsive, smart. A new mode of transport for a rapidly changing world. So turn on your life and turn on the city. The Copenhagen Wheel. And very briefly, I want to share with you how this came together, because I think something interesting is happening today in architecture, how we need to work in a much more collaborative way. We started with many ideas, many sketches at the beginning that you see here, and among the sketches was this idea of a funny looking wheel that could do that, but at the beginning it was not acknowledging it. You know, could get your energy when you break and then give it back to you when you need it. Um, we did it with a student workshop, then a student workshop finished, and when you are in doubt, you know, if in doubt, let's try it out. So these are the first sketches we put together, the motor, the batteries, all combined, assembled together. This was the first wheel, didn't look very good, but actually was working. And here was with the mayor in Copenhagen presenting it. So she liked it, and then we went back, as you always do, to the drawing board, defining better the brief, and then putting together, radically redesigning from scratch, picking the motor, you know, all the different pieces together in order to design the hub. Then we also had to connect the hub with, uh, with the rim, um, this was the first uh, idea, looked pretty terrible. Then we came up with this one, looked better, but didn't work. As you see, the torque doesn't transmit. Um, then we came up with this one, that the spokes actually touch the hub without being connected to it and then go back to the rim. And we liked it because it was quite magic, but we didn't know if this would work. So again, it's very easy today, use a laser cutter, use a 3D printer, you make a model, you test it. We can use now 3D printers that do thi things with metal or with uh, resin that's very strong. So you mount it. Some people thought this wouldn't work. He was very skeptical, as you can tell. Um, but actually this was working. So this was the, the way that we actually did uh, the wheel. Then we had to connect all of the things with, uh, with the control, how we can control this from our phone. <coughs> so, so far we had designer, architects, uh, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers in the lab. Uh, here we also had some interaction designers coming and working in order to do this. And then doing with uh, electrical engineers all that sensing. We didn't want to do this, which is what people do with, uh, with bicycles today sometimes. We want to do something very small. But with that, with just a few sensors, we can get a lot of information. If you look at this, it's Copenhagen. Just a few bicycles moving in the city will tell you a lot about air quality in, uh, in the whole city. So then we had to combine all of this together, build the prototypes. Uh, the mayor wanted to show this at a big summit where President Obama and other people were in Copenhagen. Copenhagen. Um, so we had to build them and then you know, ship them to Copenhagen, program them, uh, all of the electronics, test it, and then you know, finally present it there. Uh, what you see in the next slide is actually the presentation and the mayor of Copenhagen trying the first prototype in Copenhagen together with the mayor of Toronto. <coughs> is fantastic. It's incredible. It takes no effort. You see my bike? You start pedaling and the motor takes over. And then it, it will tell you the air quality, 
And actually, this was a few years ago. Um, this is actually the this wheel that is now is the Copenhagen wheel in production with by a startup in, in Cambridge. A smart electric hybrid by simply replacing your back wheel. Connected to your smartphone. I will stop it here, but it's actually the wheel that actually went now into production with a startup in Cambridge. What I want to do is just conclude with you. This project really brought together people from many different disciplines. And we think this is a new, different way of working and designing in a much more collaborative way. I mean, not this project in general, but it's part of a bigger trend that we're seeing today more and more. You know, we used to think that knowledge was something like this. We used to think that knowledge was something where everything could fit into the right spot. That's the same idea th St. Thomas had in the Middle Ages. But actually, if you need to think about a map of knowledge today, perhaps it looks more like this. It looks uh, like uh, this was made by Sorry, this was made using 800,000 papers looking at the connections between them. It was on the cover of uh, Nature magazine. It looks like you know, everything is connected with everything else, like on the internet. Look at those beautiful links emerging from brain research, mathematics, computer and science, and, and the social sciences. You know, uh, Nature, uh, very respected scientific journals, also looked at the top papers, the most important papers in the past and today. Now, in the past in science, the most important papers were usually by one author from one discipline. You can measure the importance of a paper by the number of citations, a bit like the likes in Facebook. Now, today, actually, the most important papers are from many people from different disciplines. And uh, we think that something like this is happening today. You know, we used to think that this was architecture. This is Le Corbusier presenting his plan for Paris. His idea was simple, demolish the whole city, leave Notre Dame and a couple of other things, and replace everything with his beautiful skyscraper. What you see here is the hand of the architect, but that's the hand of Le Corbusier, but it could be the hand of God actually proposing his plan alone for millions and millions of people. We even said, you know, you can design collaboratively. There's a saying in English says, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. So if you work together, you don't end up with a beautiful horse, you end up with, with a camel. Well, we think that all of that now is changing. Um, there's some of the things we are exploring in the book that's coming out uh, uh, next year with uh, Thames and Hudson. Uh, it's called Open Source Architecture. It started with an editorial in Domus, with an issue in Domus about open source architecture, how we can really apply open source dynamics also to the field of design, something that's been still dominated by the kind of Corbusier idea of somebody top-down designing things for hundreds thousands or millions of people. And uh, it was interesting, when we did the editorial, um, w basically the, the issue of Domus w was about uh, open source architecture, and I was asked by the editor to, to write the op-ed for that, the introduction for that. I said, I'm happy to do it, but then if it is about open source architecture, I do it in a collaborative way. So we started working on Wikipedia together with uh, Nicolas Negroponte, with Paolo Antonelli, with Hans Ulrich Obris, and many others that you see here, in order to do that as well in a, in a collaborative way. Now, the funny thing, the difficult thing is that then Domus wants to have a picture in order to say who did the editorial. Every editorial has a picture assigned to it. And then we didn't know, you know, what picture should we then use there? And in the end, we came up with the idea of, you know, combining the picture of, uh, of all of us together as, uh, as the author, as the collective author. And I wanted to finish with this to say that my wish is actually that tomorrow's architect will look a bit less like the Corbusier, the 20th century architect on his own, making a plan for millions and millions of people in a top-down way, but actually a bit more like a collaborative architect, somebody who's able to work with other disciplines, somebody who looks a little bit like the sum of all of us. Thank you. Carlo Ratti'ye bu etkileyici sunumundan dolayı teşekkür ediyoruz.